All right, everybody, welcome back to the Pursuit of Property podcast. It has taken a little bit to get this one scheduled. We've got, we had a bunch of sicknesses and vacations pop up, but we are super happy to have Morgan Kennington on the podcast, super mom, realtor, investor. And so Morgan, how are you doing? I'm good. Not throwing up anymore, thankfully. <laughs> this has been the Over hardest the podcast. I know. I know. This is the third time I think we've tried to get this done and we're getting it done. Finally. And Finally. props to Scott. <laughs> Scott's feeling a little under the weather, but we're pushing it through. Decided not to reschedule this one again. We needed to have this podcast episode. We've been eagerly waiting for too long, so I know we are super excited to have you on. Good. Me too. I'm happy to be here. So we wanted to have you come in because you're doing a lot right now. Um, first off, we had Ashley Full come in and talk about balancing life. We're going to want to ask you some questions about that too. Sure. But also, you're doing a lot of management. You're dealing with a lot of sales. You're dealing with a lot of investors. You're training a lot of people. We just kind of wanted to pick your brain about kind of all the things that you're doing. And let's start by just seeing how you got into real estate. Okay. So that's a, okay. So I actually got licensed back in 2017, but I didn't really get into real estate until 20. 19. Um, at the time we were living in LA and that's when I got licensed and I thought I'm going to be a, you know, a stay at home mom primarily, but I'm going to do real estate on the side. This is going to be great. Mm -hmm. But when I got my license, I realized I wasn't ready to jump into a business. And I was in the middle of raising two kids. I had a newborn baby. I was struggling a little bit with postpartum depression and, um, just certain things in my life weren't really lining up for me to be able to jump into real estate full time or even part-time at that point. Um, but then my husband and I moved back to Clovis. He mm -hmm. got a job back here and we moved back here and that was in 2019. And um, at that point, that's when I decided to jump in. Mm -hmm. And I actually joined, I don't know if you guys know, it's Ed and Hart Realty and Design. They're a local brokerage here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, they're awesome. Um, they taught me a lot. They kind of helped me get my feet wet. I learned transaction coordinating through them because, you know, when you first start out, you don't have a ton of listings, you don't have a ton of transactions going on, so you try to use use what opportunities you can to, right. you know, to, to learn the business. So I jumped into to transaction coordinating work and um, and that's where I started. And what, did you do anything before real estate? What drew you to even wanting to get your license and then yeah. holding on to it and, and waiting until it was the right time? Yeah, that's a good question. So my husband and I have owned rentals for the last over 10 years. Wow. Um, we owned one in Utah, which we sold and then we own one here in Fresno. So we've been landlords and have been, you know, in that side of real estate for a long time. Um, apart from that though, I really just, you know, I was obsessed with HGTV. We loved going to model homes on the weekends just for fun. I loved, you know, just that part of it. It just seemed fun. Mm -hmm. And lots of realtor moms that I had talked to over the years were like, <laughs> oh, it's great, you know? If you wanna be a realtor and be a mom, like it's totally doable. So yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, let's try it. Very nice. That's so when, really all it was. <laughs> so when you came back to Clovis, all of a sudden, did it just the the stars align for you to get started? or? Yeah, I think so. Because moving back here, we had family here. We didn't have family in L.A. So gotcha. I, didn't have, I had no help with my kids unless I you know, hired someone. Um, so that helped a lot when we moved back here. My mm -hmm. mother-in-law's here. I have sisters here. Uh, my brother as well. So um, yeah, having help with the kids was a big factor. And then also just, yeah, I think the stars just aligned. Things just felt right. Um, it, 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 and I was in a, a better space mentally and emotionally to be able to want to get into business. So yeah. gotcha. And what took you out of transaction managing into a more active role? Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. How did you meet Jason? I was following him on social media for like, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe six months. And you know, I was kind of like everybody else. I just loved watching his stories, loved taking in all the wisdom that he provides and just all the little coaching tips he's constantly giving out regarding investing and, mm -hmm. and all that. And so one day I was watching a, one of his stories and I had like already been very intentional before this. Like I was, I was telling myself every day, okay, notice opportunities. Like you don't want to be a transaction coordinator forever. Mm -hmm. You want to like, you know, Notice opportunities that come your way and jump at them if it feels right. Gotcha. So I happened to be watching one of his stories one day and he was basically just saying, you know what, I've got a position open up for a project manager, but this time I really would like this person to be a licensed realtor. Um, I want her to understand transaction coordinating work and I want her to be bilingual. <laughs> Those are the three things that I remember. And the bilingual thing wasn't like 
it ha- you have to be this, mm-hmm. but it's something that stood out to me because I am bilingual and I speak Spanish. Oh, really? I, no yeah, way. Yeah. I wore, so I served a mission for my church and I lived in Spain for a year and a half. Oh, so, gotcha. Yeah. I'm not as fluent as I used to be, but I can still carry a conversation. So anyway, I was like, oh my gosh, okay. I, I am licensed. I know Spanish, <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. I, I understand TC work because I've been doing it at uh-huh. Art. So it just felt right. And I just reached out to him via, you know, a DM. And I was like, hey, I am totally interested in this position. Um, I'd love to talk to you talk to you and see uh-huh. where it goes and he was like okay come to my office at keller williams and we'll start interviewing you wow so yeah and, uh, yeah go for it so you interview you end up getting the position with jason now we'll ask you like kind of what that whole position entails but was it what you expected going in how has it been for you with your expectations of what that was going to look like into what it actually is now yeah, that's a good question. I I think I thought it was going to be, I didn't know what to expect at first. Going into it, I was like, project management. Okay, I understand he does a lot of flips and stuff, and it's, you know, I'm probably going to be overseeing some of that, which scared me a little bit because I'd never done anything like that, but I told myself, no matter what, you're going to jump at opportunities that feel right, mm-hmm. and this one felt right. So, um, yeah, as I, as I jumped in, it was kind of like, some of it was what I expected and uh, and some of it was like totally like, oh my gosh, holy crap. How like, okay, there's there's like six to seven projects going on all the time and I've never even managed one. So that right. was a big learning curve. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. And at this point in the game, you know, I'm a year and a half into it. I can do that, you know, kind of like secondhand nature and it's fun for me and everything. But yeah, at first it was, that was a big learning curve. Um, and something that surprised me was how many projects at once would always be going on. And yeah. then I'd have to learn to juggle. So, yeah, yeah. It seems like right now you have a lot on your plate because you also, correct me if I'm wrong. So you manage the flipping side, mm-hmm. the project development, I and do. then you manage the sales side, and then you also have your whole personal life, and yes. you probably have clients outside adjacent, yes. right? Yes. So how have you learned to like juggle that? It sounds like when you first started a year and a half ago, you had no experience with that many transactions. Yeah, I had to learn fast. Um, I think a lot of it has come from, well, I know a lot of it has come from just being intentional and being in the right mindset. You know, I think, especially as a mom, it's like you have constant thoughts that are like anxiety driven or fear based driven. Like you feel, you know, I can't do this. Like, who am I to think that I can be a high performance mom and a high performance real real estate professional? Mm -hmm. And I think I just have to be intentional every single day and tell myself that, yeah, I absolutely can do both. And it is possible. And, um, and just, you know, be intentional with the thoughts that I'm thinking every single day. Apart from that, it's being as organized as I can be in my daily schedule and my calendar, making sure that when I'm going through what what's needed for projects throughout each day i'm also going through what's needed for each of my own personal escrows and i'm not missing anything you know right. um also leveraging help like yeah. using a va using a tc yep makes oh my gosh a world of difference so so and how well i'll mention this because you you had shot us a text i think yesterday saying Hey, just wanted to check in, see what time we're going to wrap up because 1030, I got to be back home, take my kids yeah. and I got to drive them. Right. <laughs> so how, how has it been for you from when you started a year and a half ago to now? I know you mentioned some of the things you do to achieve that work-life balance mm-hmm. or work-life balance, excuse me. But how have you seen that trajectory and, and journey change as you've learned and utilized all of those things you just mentioned? How have I seen my, my personal journey change yeah, and evolve? And, yes. And how have you seen your emotions kind of go from, you know, in the beginning, a year and a half ago, right? Never really having experience mm-hmm. juggling one project, let alone six to seven, but also having t- three kids, newborn kid on the way, right? H- how has that looked for you to now when you look back and see, holy crap, yeah. I'm doing this now. And I, I would assume probably at the best point you've been in your career. Yes, for sure. Yes, that's safe to say, definitely. Um, I think a lot of it has been, it's been from coaching that I've received from Jason. Um, you know, I feel like when you're going through stuff like this and you're learning, it's very easy to get down on yourself and to think, I, I can't do this. I can't do all of this. 
but having someone like Jason, who's your boss, but is also like, he acts like he's a partner Mm -hmm. and like he's, he's a mentor and he's there for you. Um, and just being able to, to lean on him for support when I need it has been really, really helpful and has really helped me grow like so much faster than I could otherwise. Yeah. You know? Um, and I think at this point, looking back to where I was a year and a half ago, I never would have thought I'd be where I am now. You know, it's kind of amazing. I'm sure you guys can feel that same way when you think of all the investments and all the, the success you guys have had together. Like there's a lot that went, that went into that to make Uh that possible. Um, so yeah, I mean, you gotta give yourself credit. So I try to do that as often as possible (laughs) yeah seems fair you know a lot of our podcast listeners are people who are new to the industry or working to get into the industry Mm -hmm. or maybe they have some success but they're developing that right yeah um can you think back like when you were first starting taking over project management obviously you were taking over all the sales side as well what were some of the things that you were doing like day to day to stay organized and like to continue to get past that learning curve Do you remember like what your schedule looked like? Yeah. So honestly, it's like, I think for me, and I learned this from Jason, waking up, well, first of all, I have to wake up before my kids. I have to make sure that I have adequate time for myself and to get my mind right. I have to make sure that I have time to meditate in the mornings, you know, put my AirPods in, listen to something to get me inspired and motivated and ready for the day. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a big part of it. Um, And then something that Jason has taught us is to go through your calendar even after the day is done and fill in the chunks of time and write what you did. And it helps you be able to look back and think, okay, did I use all my time for that? Like, did I do it efficiently? And did I, were there spaces where I could have done that quicker and I could have used this time to be more productive in this area? Yeah. That's been a huge game changer as well. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Did did he teach you guys to do that? Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's like (laughs) it's like organization 101. We took that and we did a whole podcast episode talking about scheduling and using a calendar effectively. And literally all all of those skills we learned were directly from Jason. Totally. Yeah. And they work. Yeah. That's the thing. They make a huge difference. So you so you wake up early, you start getting your mind right. And then Mm -hmm. you you have to obviously handle all of your home life stuff. What time are you getting to the office usually? Or what time are you getting to work? Um, So, I mean, I work from home, so I don't go into the office. But when I start work, we start our meetings every day at 11 o'clock. But gotcha. me personally, there are things that I have to do before we jump into our meetings. Mm-hmm. Like I've got to check in with contractors every morning if there's something something needed for a specific project. You know, if granite needs to be ordered that day or if we're ready to do a punch list for another project. You know, I have to make sure I'm coordinating all those things. Um, and aside from that, I am checking in with Jason mm-hmm. every single morning. I make sure that I send him. We communicate in Slack. Uh-huh. So every morning about 830, I send him an update for the day, just letting him know like, hey, I've got this under control. This is happening with this project. Um, This is something I need from you today, you know, things like that. So um, that's been really helpful too, to just make sure everything's staying on track and that he has peace of mind knowing that everything is as it should be. Mm -hmm. So you started, moved back in 2019. When did you start officially with Jason? Was it late 2019 or was it 2020? Early 2020. No, I was still with Ed and Hart in 2019. And then I think we're in 2022, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I joined Jason beginning of 2021. Okay. So February gotcha. of 2021. So yeah. now you're almost a year and a half mm-hmm. into the position yeah. you've been in on Jason's team. You know, six, seven plus, I'm sure, projects going on at a single time that the whole time you've been working, right? Is there a favorite project that stands out or a nightmare project that stands out? I feel like a nightmare project might be more fun to ask. Okay, perfect. (laughs) So if you have both, I'd love to hear them. Okay. So I'll give you my favorite one first. My favorite one was a project called the Holland project and it was a a property located in Clovis. Um, we finished it back in March, I want to say. Yeah. In March. Um, and it sold really fast and everything. And we got, how much over asking? We got like thirty-two thousand dollars over asking price, and it was wow. yeah, and we closed on that, and that was awesome. Um, but it was such a fun project for me because it was one of the first ones that I was like truly intentional about every piece 
that I was putting in that house. Every fixture that I put in, every bit of tile, like every, I wanted this house to have a vibe to it and a feeling. Um, and I was really just intentional about the energy that I was trying to uh, radiate in that uh -huh, house. Mm -hmm. And just, I wanted it to, to really stand out from other projects and it totally did. And I think all the offers that we got kind of proved to me, like when you put that kind of energy into a project, it pays off, you know? Yeah. And the fact that it sold for 30, you know, 32,000 over asking, it was one of definitely one of our biggest wins for sure. And it got tons of compliments and just tons of people like, Thing. I think 70 plus people came to the first open house, which. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you spent a lot of time. I mean, when you were thinking about managing that project, mm -hmm. how many projects had you done approximately up to this point? Up to that point? Oh, gosh. Um, you can ballpark. Maybe 20. Maybe 20. Yeah, so this was the first so. one where you spent a lot of time really thinking like, this is how this should look. Yes, because I mean, I always, I always know how I'm going to design a project and I always am, you know, intentional to a point. Right. But there's also a system in place and was all, and was already in place by the time I joined Jason. You know, there was always, you know, these are kind of the three designs that we mm -hmm. like to go with. You don't want to reinvent the wheel every single time you do a project. Right. Just pick from these three and say, all right, these this is the color scheme, these are the types of fixtures, and let's let's run and gun. Let's go for it. Yeah. Um so that's how I managed most of them. And that's how you should manage most of the time. So that it runs efficiently, so that you know um, you're your using contractors your contractors Exactly. Know. Your contractors know. It's kind of predictable. You can send them a design temp a template and they know what to get. Uh -huh. um, so you need that part of, of the business to run well. But, you know, once in a while, it's fun to really be able to make it snazzy and make it super special. And that was a project that I really tried to do that on. And Jason um, agreed that it was one of the best ones he'd ever seen. So that That's was awesome. fun. Yeah. Well, and like you were mentioning, super important to have that organized and structured part of the business because as I'm sure you know, numbers and project management can get out of hand when you just totally. continue to dump money into a property where you're not going to see that return, that return. Yeah. right? Like somewhere in you know one of the areas of downtown Fresno, you're not going to spruce up and dump as much money in as you're going to put into a home, for example, in downtown Clovis. Exactly. I mean, that's just the fact yep. of the matter, right? But have you done any of those since the Holland project being like putting your own twist in it or, or making it unique to you and kind of making it yeah. your baby or your project? Yeah, actually. Um, I don't know. Was it the one I did right after it might've been two project, two projects after the Holland project, but it was one that we partnered with um, a local agent on and he's also an investor. It's nice. his name's Miguel, Miguel Sanchez. Uh -huh. um, he found this house and locked it up in contract for us and, partnered with Jason because Jason, you know, he's really good at raising the money for these mm -hmm. projects. So that one, um, that one was really intentional too. And, you know, I felt like I really wanted to, wanted it to be a, a modern farmhouse look with some trendy stuff and mm -hmm. subway tile with the dark grout and, um, you know, certain fixtures that really pop and backsplash. Yeah. Yeah. Def definitely. That one was, that one was fun too. And that was the first house that we had decided to switch up the exterior color scheme because so many of our flips are just the traditional yeah. white with black trim. Uh -huh. You know, it's classic, <laughs> it looks good, most people love it. So it's a safe one to go with. But on this one, I wanted to, um, we wanted to try blue. So we painted mm -hmm. the house blue, um, put some nice stained shutters on the windows mm -hmm. and did some other, you know, trim work. And it looked really good. Like we loved it. And it was fun to see like, you don't always have to do yeah. the same stuff. You can yeah. switch it up and it's, it's super fun. And yeah, the buyer loved it. So, well, and you guys have a lot of success stories. That's what obviously has kept you guys in business. Yeah. You, you guys are able to do so much. It sounded like you had one that you had thought of that went particularly oh, yeah. south. <laughs> I still have PTSD from it. Um, <laughs> And the, oddly enough, this was like only my second or third project. <laughs> oh, it to always be how yes. it goes. <laughs> but that's probably why I learned so fast because I was dealing with, you know, situations like this. So this one was, I think a lot of your listeners might even know kind of this house. It was called Larry's house. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh yeah. I, can, I remember all like the Like this Instagram house just stories. had bad juju. <laughs> like it was a horrible place. And, um, and Larry was a tenant there who was like just unwilling to leave. Eventually, he finally agreed to accept a cash for keys agreement from Jason, and he he left for a few days. And then, like as we were getting the project started, he showed back up, and so did some of his other buddies that are like homeless or whatever. Excuse uh. me. So anyway, we were dealing with these people for the entire project, literally. 
like um, Eusebio, our contractor, would do a bunch of work. And then the next morning, he called me and be like, hey, they broke in last night. They undid basically everything I did yesterday. I was like, oh, my gosh. And this was the way the project went almost until the very end. We were constantly, like, refixing things, ordering new glass for windows they broke in, like putting in new doors that they busted down. Um, just so many things constantly were going wrong because of these people that kept messing with the house. They even tried to set it on fire one time. Yeah. Eusebio went down into the it – it had, like, a weird – basement that you actually get in from the outside and you go down under the house oh okay yeah and um he went down there thankfully and he happened to find a candle that they had lit and left sitting in there (laughs) wow (laughs) i know and i'm like oh my gosh wow i know it was a nightmare and so it was literally i learned a lot on that project one i learned that you cannot stress yourself out over things you can't control you've just got to be able to get good at controlling the controllables as jason would Uh say and um, I feel like I got pretty good at that on that project. And yeah. I just did what I could every single day to keep things in line. If if they broke in and did something, I just, okay, this is where we are today. This is what we're going to do to fix it. And we'll move forward and we'll see where we're at tomorrow. And I tried to really keep that mindset the whole time throughout the project. Um, it was very stressful at times. But by the end, you know, the house, it got sold. And it was it was a win. It was a very big win by the time it was all said and done. Well, good. Yeah. And so you obviously you said that was pretty early on in your career. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, at that point, was it hard to take yourself out of the stress of that project to work on your other stuff? Not really. After I after I did that project, I was like, I can freaking do any project that comes <laughs> my way. Like I can handle anything now. And I was yeah, all these other projects seemed way easier after that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome. And and so obviously you you've had some good experiences and you've had some not so good experiences yeah. um at this point when you're working on six or seven projects plus mm-hmm. at any point in time is there always one project that's kind of going sideways or is it normally pretty smooth sailing and every once in a um, while something comes up i don't know if i would say totally sideways but yeah there's always i'd say one project that is maybe lagging a little bit or certain things aren't getting done as mm-hmm. quickly as they need to or maybe there's something on back order because of you know, inflation and supply demand issues right now. Um, but that's probably the worst of it, honestly. It's like mm. sometimes projects are just falling behind a little bit. But in the end, we always get them done. Yeah. So. Well, and now you guys are spending a lot of time. So part of why we wanted to have you come on is because mm-hmm. you're spending a lot of time helping other people. And yeah. I know that you helped me a lot on one of my recent flips, and that's really helpful. Um, but we wanted to kind of give you a platform to talk through a little bit about what you talk with people about um, to see if we can just introduce them to you in a way that uh, feels a little bit more organic than, you know, just trying to go log into a Zoom. Yeah, sure. So I do I do Zoom meetings every Wednesday and usually Fridays, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, they kind of just I'm just there to provide value, like whatever whoever signs up for these meetings with me we talk about whatever they want to talk about if they just need to understand what investing is and how to get started like we'll talk about that if they want to understand better exit strategies for their properties we talk about that um some of them just need coaching on mindset a lot of the time Uh just need you know help understanding like okay this is the way i need to think about it this is this 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 fear that i have it's just a fear it's not real, you know, and I can overcome that and I can get around that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, we just talk about whatever they need, they need to talk about. And it typically does involve, uh, revolve around investing or just getting starting and started in real estate in general. Uh huh. Now, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to confirm, is it a group meeting or is it one-on-one right now? These are just one-on-one. Gotcha. In the future, I'll offer, we'll offer group meetings. And actually, Jason and I are working a lot on trying to build out our coaching platform at Real. We're at Real Brokerage. And um, we have a big vision for it. And it's something we really feel like can provide so much value to agents because so many agents out there are high, are high performing, but getting burnt out on feeling like they're never going to get off this hamster wheel of, okay, when's the next listing? All right, the next listing, right. All right, the next buyer. So we really want to help people make that shift from Mm -hmm. real estate agent to investor, you know, and understand how you can do both and how you can um, leverage the investment side of business to really grow like long-term generational wealth. 
to yeah. your family. And that's what I wanted to ask on because I know you had mentioned, you know, even before you got your license and got into the business, you and your husband, you guys had owned rental property before you guys had been landlords. Mm-hmm. After being in this position and being a real estate professional for the past few years, absorbing and soaking up knowledge from, you know, your position as a project manager yeah. working on Jason's team and now coaching other people. Have you shifted at all into boosting up your personal investments at all, whether, you know, more rental property or short term rental property, or I don't know, is it a goal of yours to flip houses totally. on your own as well? Mm-hmm. So I'm curious to hear that. Yes. Um, that is one of my goals this year actually is to flip a property with Jason mm-hmm. that's, that came from me. Uh huh. Um, I also have a goal. Well, me and my husband both have a goal to grow our, our rental portfolio. Um, we'd like to acquire one more rental before the end of this year. And um, I am starting to kind of up level my own personal marketing for that and do more direct to seller stuff. Um, so, yes, absolutely. That's a goal of mine. And it, it's a long term goal, short term and long term. <laughs> <laughs> and where you guys you mentioned rental property. A lot of people we talk to, they're like, are you looking and buying in California? Are, are you not buying in California? When you say rental property, one, are you talking long-term, short-term, and two, where are you looking? Or where would you like to look? Yeah, so we we focus a lot in Clovis and Fresno, um, and really anything in Fresno County I'm willing mm-hmm. to look at. And overall, we want to acquire more long-term rentals than short-term rentals, but... I feel like I've, you know, learned a lot about Airbnb over the last year because Jason, you know, part of the business is we've been growing out that side of it is the Airbnb mm-hmm. stuff. And um, absolutely, we want to get some some properties that we can turn into an Airbnb. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I'd say our, our biggest goal is to grow our long-term rental portfolio for sure. So this wasn't part of our original questions that we were thinking mm-hmm. of, but it's been so long since we had originally messaged you about coming on the podcast, I was going to ask, um, with the way that the market's kind of shaking up right now, mm-hmm. have you guys changed how your business is operating in any way? Or are you guys coaching agents differently than what you were doing maybe even just a few months ago? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I think we try to not, we don't want to put it out there that like, okay, you need to be scared and you need to freak out and change everything about your business because you know the market's going the market's going crap like we're not saying that at all but we are saying like buckle up and get smarter and make sure that the properties that you're trying to put under contract truly make sense make sure the numbers really do work and you've got a good margin in there and a good spread Uh um we ourselves are focusing on properties that are going to resell for at or below the median price which Market right now, price, which right now is around 370, 360 ish, yeah. you know, Okay. I would say. So, um, yeah, we're, we're moving away from higher end projects unless, unless it's just a killer deal and it absolutely would be stupid not to go for it. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, Other than that, we're keeping it simple. And then are you guys also finding any difference in, um, the deal flow? I think we are starting to see more sellers are willing to talk, uh, to us as cash buyers because, mm-hmm. They don't feel the same ability to go list a home, even if it's in really bad shape. Right. Um, have you guys seen any influx there? I think so, yes. Um, honestly, we've closed several deals lately, um, just like right over the phone, watching Jason do it. We do these sales trainings every Thursday, and he'll often call a seller live, and it's usually one that has either we've had a conversation with them before or our VA has talked to him before or he's received a piece of direct mail or something and we'll just call him right there. And it's amazing how close Jason can get them to agreeing to sign a contract right there on uh-huh. one, on the, like on one call. Right. You know? And I think it is, I think it's because they're, they're opening up to, to their options. They're yeah. opening up to, to working with investors that'll pay cash and realizing that might, that might be the best solution for them in this market. Yeah. Yeah. And, on, on that note, right, I think it's important. Scott and I always talk about it, and I'm sure you guys take the same exact approach because we, we learned it from being on Clayson under Benny and under Jason, mm-hmm. is taking that consultive approach, right? Being able to say, yeah. you know, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, you know, it's it sounds like you're leaning towards this cash option route, right? Here's what we can provide here. You know, if not, yeah. 
we've got an agent on our team who, you know, if it makes more exactly. sense to list, here's what those numbers would look like. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, you know, if you were to list it in its current condition, you know, if, if you can list it in its current condition, the numbers aren't that that far off. But then it's just putting it in the hands of the seller and being like, hey, which option do you prefer? Or this is the solution that we can provide for you for your problems. Exactly. I think, yeah, the biggest thing has always been being able to help the other person feel. And I think what Jason does such a good job of is helping the other party, the other, the seller feel understood and appreciated, totally. right? And that no one's taking advantage of them. Exactly. And when you get, when you position it like that and you, you know, help them see you have options, these are your options. We're here to, we're here to provide a solution for you one way or the other. It helps them feel safe and I think empowered and like, okay, this is my choice and what makes most sense for me. Yeah. And you, making it a win-win for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Are a lot of the people that you're working with, are they also agent investors? Um, like on our team? Uh, that join your calls and that are, are oh, yes. tuning in with you yes. guys. So we do trainings and, and calls every week, Tuesdays and Thursdays at our brokerage. And, um, and yes, I think everyone who joins in, honestly, is either at the point where they're starting to be an investor and starting to grow that side of business, or they've already been doing it for a while and they just want to up level their business hmm. and that's when that's where jason and i step in so Very so a nice. little bit of a shift let me ask you out of because obviously you have your own clients right as an agent you help your clients buy uh buy a home list their home on the open market right also full-time project manager now a coach right and and everything in between what do you enjoy what aspect of the business do you enjoy the most is it the coaching is it being, you know, an a- an agent and doing those activities. What's your favorite thing in this business? The coaching. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I think I mean, my gosh, real, real estate is just fun in general, so I really do enjoy every aspect of it. Um being an agent is really fulfilling because of the connections that you make with people and, you know, just being able to provide that help and walk people through transactions. It's definitely rewarding. But um, coaching for sure is where my heart truly is. And I think that's where I feel like I can provide the most impact for people. Um, it just feels so good to be able to, to provide value and to be able to help others get to where they want to be. And um, I know Jason feels that same way. He's got mm-hmm. the heart of a coach 100%. So, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, I, that's absolutely my most favorite part of the business. What about least favorite? <laughs> my least favorite is, oh gosh, um... If you don't say appraisals, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually waiting on an appraisal to come back right now. I was thinking about that. Um, yeah, probably appraisals and re- repair requests. Yeah. Those are my two Dealing with that requests. side of the business. Yep. Both of which are fall under the real estate agent umbrella, and they which do. is yes. <laughs> is no surprise <laughs> to me there. <laughs> and it's like you get better at managing that stuff the longer you do it. And, um, and I think I have gotten pretty good at repair requests because as the project manager for all of the flips that I sell for Jason, I'm in charge of all that. Mm -hmm, So I have to coordinate all of it. I have to make sure that they're actually getting done. I have to make sure that, you know, everyone's satisfied. So it's helped me become a much better like problem problem solver than I used to be. And um, so that's, there's something to be said for that, even though I don't enjoy it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, at this point, you know, it sounds like you, you guys are doing a lot, you know, what's the best way for somebody who's interested in joining your Zooms, joining your guys' calls, what's the best way to reach out? Um, I say reach out to us on social media. <clears throat> okay. Me. You can reach out to me. I'm My handle is Morgan Kennington Realtor. That's uh-huh. what I am on Instagram. Um, you can reach out to me, send me a DM, let me know you want to start joining our calls. If you are an agent with Real and you want to join our, our team, then you have the option to, to join our calls. So there's a big value opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Um, if you just want some coaching and to ask some questions about investing in general and maybe switching brokerages or, you know, whatever's on your mind, you can reach out to me as well. And we can just schedule a one-on-one coaching call. Awesome. And then to wrap up, like Scott had mentioned a little earlier, the whole focus of our podcast and the majority of our listeners is helping those just getting into the business or looking to get into the business Mm -hmm. to do their first deal. All of the things that go into becoming a successful real estate professional, Mm -hmm. I'd call it, right? Investor, agent, whatever it is. If there was one piece of advice that you could give to, you know, old Morgan who was just getting into the business or 
a new person looking to get into the business or struggling to find success or find their first deal, what would that be? What do you think that the one key would be that you, that you could share? Um, gosh, there's a lot of different things I would say, but I think at the end of the day, one of the most important things is doing, choosing to go after it, even though it's uncomfortable. Um, stretch yourself, do it, do it scared, even though, you know, you may not feel like you know what the heck you're doing at first. Um, just do it anyway and start somewhere and be consistent. Consistency is key. And if you keep going, you will eventually see results. That's what I will say to everybody. <laughs> be I think that's consistent. Perfect. So yeah. Operating out of your comfort zone and being consistent. Yep. Those two things. I love it. For sure. Well, hey, Morgan, thank you so much for coming on. Like we said in the sure. beginning, we are so happy and so pumped. We finally were able to get this scheduled and it all it's been worked a while. out. <laughs> and uh, guys, if you were listening, make sure if you guys have any questions, if you want to do one of those one on one calls, uh, reach out to Morgan on Instagram. If you guys are interested in, you know, doing the more trainings, if you're already with real, or like you said, I think those bigger trainings are more real exclusive. Any questions, just hit up Morgan on Instagram, but Morgan, thank you so much again for coming on totally. thank and you we'll see you guys next week. Bye.